This is the Cultural Fluency Podcast with Angèle Preto, the French coach, that's me. And today in episode number eight, I am with Derek Sivers, who describes himself as a musician, producer, circus performer, entrepreneur, TED speaker, and book publisher. So thank you, Derek, for being here. I haven't seen you in a very long time. I haven't actually talked to you in a really long time because uh, we used to work together back in 2017. So that's a while. So awesome to have you back here. Uh, you also... Welcome. You also describe yourself as monomaniac, introvert, slow thinker, and you love finding a different point of view, which is it's awesome because it's the whole point of this podcast, just to find that diverse point of view and how we can be fluent across all the different cultures. I immediately want to ask you how you can be both monomaniac and have a total of six carriers listed in your 10 second bio. Uh, and that's a very, rather narrow list compared to everything you've done. So how, how does that work together? You also lived in different parts of the US, but Singapore, Oxford, Portugal, now in New Zealand, and I'm sure that I've forgotten some, like, how? <laughs> um, it's funny, when I actually changed something on my website recently to say that all of those things you listed at the beginning, those are past tense. Like, I have been a musician. Mm -hmm. I have been a circus performer. And I used to list them as present tense, um, but then realized well, I'm not that anymore. I was an entrepreneur. Uh, I was a circus performer, but I think some of us get an identity and hold on to it for right. too long. You know, um, just because somebody was an athlete in high school doesn't mean they can call themselves an athlete forever. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point your title expires. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you were to ask, what am I now? I think only an author. Right. So to answer your monomaniac question, like, yeah, I get really into one thing at a time. And if you do that over a number of years, I mean, I'm 52 now. So if you do this for a number of years, you end up with a long list of things that you've done in the past and it makes you look impressive, but really it's just one thing at a time. Right, right. That makes sense. Uh, you're also known for the statement, hell yeah or no. So I think it ties in together a little bit. Um, can you share a bit this philosophy in case some of the listeners have never heard of it? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is it a philosophy? It's a, it's a way of, way of life. Attitudes. making a choice when you've got too many options. So the, the idea goes like this, that usually most of us say yes to too many things. We say yes to things that we feel kind of okay about, or somebody says, hey, can you do this thing with me? Or do you want to attend this event? And you say, yeah, okay, sure. Because you don't mm -hmm. want to miss out. But then right. what happens is you've said yes to too many things, too many responsibilities, too many roles, too many uh, projects that you've told yourself that you want to complete. And because you've said yes to too much, you end up, doing all of them poorly mm -hmm. or feeling bad that you're not doing all of them well. Right. And so a while back, I was describing this situation to a friend. And as we talked about it, she said, it sounds like you're not trying to decide between yes and no. You're trying to decide between fuck yeah or no. Right. And I said, yeah, that's what it really comes down to is if you're if you're feeling anything less than oh hell yeah that would be amazing yes then you should just say no mm -hmm. which means you're going to say no to almost everything but what that does is it leaves this space in your life like suddenly you have time you have free time to to leave space i think I, most of us want to fill up all the space in our life. Mm -hmm. But instead, if you leave space, then when that occasional rare something great comes along, you have the time and the space to say yes to it. So that's the hell yeah or no idea is to say no to almost everything so that when that occasional great thing comes along, then you can throw yourself into that entirely. Right. And I think that's just a better life to lead instead of doing a lot of things mm -hmm. kind of 
half-ass. You just do the occasional rare thing all the way. Right. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. I mean, I think more of us should really uh, engage with this and just get fully involved in the one thing you want to do. That makes me even more happy that yeah. you have decided to accept this interview because <laughs> you said no to almost everything. So what I made do, you say, but what yeah. made you say yes to this one? Oh, because it's you, because we're Aww. friends, because, you know, it's a different, uh, a different judge, you know, for if it's just strangers, I say, well, okay, what's the size of your audience? Is this mm -hmm. going to be worth doing? Mm -hmm. uh, when you ask, I just say yes. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, I might remember that <laughs> and perhaps <laughs> reuse so, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or, or uh, yeah, to, to be more specific, when you asked, I was like, oh, Hell yeah, absolutely. You know, cool. Angel asks the answers. Yes, that's, so. that's yeah, I've so just nice. always said, thank you, admired you and what you do, and I've always loved. Yeah, you and I, we worked for I think six months or so. Yeah, at least. Yeah, it, it, maybe yeah, six to eight, nine months total to um to learn Esperanto. Uh, yes. In 2017, we did weekly phone calls mm -hmm. for Quite, uh yeah six to nine. We did daily months. at some point, I think. Oh yeah, you're right. Correctly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you were really yeah. like perhaps a bit more the maniac with Esperanto at that point. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yes, that's the monomania. <laughs> that was my primary focus at that time in my life. I had never yet really learned a second language, mm -hmm. and it was on the advice of Benny Lewis. He said, right. uh, "If you've never learned a second language, I recommend you start with Esperanto because it's so easy that you'll get the experience of a second language in your tongue, in your yeah. mind, easier um, than any other language. And yeah, it worked. If, if I had to do it all over again in hindsight, um, I think I might have just spent like a month on Esperanto with you and said, okay, like now we're now we're having conversations. Four hours per day language. instead of one. <laughs> it could be well, or yeah, something yeah. like that. And then just done maybe one month of it and then turned my attention to a language I was actually going to use in the future, mm -hmm. like Portuguese. Right. Um, that probably would have been smarter, but oh well, we had fun. Did, did you? Yeah, we did. Did you actually learn Portuguese in the end? No, uh, I started Damn. to. Why? I know because um, I lost. Uh, sorry, this is like a wonky thing but I lost my Portuguese visa because of COVID um oh, yeah, that I had sense, to the idea was you have to keep going back to Portugal to mm -hmm. to live there for a while to renew my yeah. resident visa and because I live in New Zealand I cannot leave the country because our borders are very shut right now mm -hmm. so um I mean well technically sorry I could leave but I couldn't come back right which is, which is <laughs> so, worse <laughs> yeah um so uh so I lost my Portuguese visa which meant that suddenly, although I was going to learn Portuguese, suddenly it just didn't make it didn't make rational sense. It got mm -hmm. bumped down my list of things to do. Right. Yeah. So is, is that also why you have decided to live full time in New Zealand and to just do away with your other homes because of the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah. COVID made that choice for me. Too bad. Yeah. But I mean, you, at least you've yeah. had the experience of living in all these other countries and hopefully the pandemic is not forever so you know yeah well you. it's funny for those of us who live in many places or could live in many places it's always good to ask yourself like if i had to be in only one country for the rest of my life which one would i choose mm -hmm. and it's a way of knowing what your favorite country is and Maybe it's the one where you grew up because your connection to your parents matter or something like that. Maybe it's, yeah. you know, one you've more recently discovered. So to me, New Zealand was that country where if I could, if I could only be in one country for the rest of my life, I always knew that this was the one. Mm -hmm. I'd lived out here already for six years. And so even though I was living in England when COVID hit, I knew what my answer was. So when it looked like that's the way the world was going, I kind of quickly returned to New Zealand. Oh, so you... And COVID made half the choice, you made the other half. Um, well, COVID made me choose. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, I could have, I could have just stayed in England, mm -hmm. but um, I'm sorry, I don't know if this is interesting to your no, listeners. No, no, I don't know. Like I, think it, I think up. it is interesting <laughs> that, I mean, COVID has forced many people to do many things. 
And mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting to know just what it has looked like for you. I mean, for me, it's also interesting because uh, the country that I want, if I wanted to live my entire life in one country, that would be Austria and specifically Vienna. And actually, when, mm. we, when we met, I was living in Germany back then. I yeah. was in between my two Austrian times. And I, I mm -hmm. was really kind of proud of myself, even though I couldn't possibly have done it on purpose, because I moved to Vienna right before, like six months before the pandemic hit. And mm. I would have hated to have to spend that time in Berlin. Like, I already hated yeah. Berlin without lockdown. So with lockdown, it's... <laughs> Why yeah. did you choose New Zealand? What was the what's the reason for you? Um, originally, it was just because I had a baby. Um, mm -hmm. I was living in Singapore and had a baby in Singapore. And at first right. I thought Singapore was going to be his permanent home. Like mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, this is a great country. I love Singapore. He was born here. That's it. He's going to grow up Singaporean. Uh, his mom is Indian right. and I'm white. <laughs> and, um, so he's formerly American, recently resigned. <laughs> yeah. Um, how, you know, what am I? I'm half Swedish, half English, basically. Um, is that the two passports you have now? Swedish and English? No, no, no. Or... Not passport wise. Oh, I just mean like right. grandparents, parents, you know. Right. Um, uh, what was that? This down is arrows, a, like this is such that was a the family tree say. pointing down. <laughs> right. Is such it? a French play. I, I mean, my, my reaction was so French. Like, oh yeah, you healthy. Those are your passports, because we think ah. of citizenship as a paperwork, not descent. Right. Yeah, you're right. I I think. Well, so sorry. Let's just take a tangent for a second. It's yeah. funny growing up in America. Um, at least it was this way when I was growing up as a kid. I don't know if it still is, but people would often say. Like, where are you from? But mm -hmm. I'm just talking like your classmates when you're eight yeah. years old. You say, where are you from? And somebody says, oh, well, I'm Irish. And somebody else says, I'm Italian. Somebody says, I'm Swedish. And it's in America, unless you're Native American, nobody is from there. Mm -hmm. And it's only, you know, been the last 200 years. So everybody has this strong sense of like, my family came from Ireland. My right. family came from Poland. My family came from Russia. And... So it's part of your identity as a kid mm -hmm. is, yeah, we're in America, I'm American, but where are you from? Totally not a thing in France. Like, this is so exotic mm -hmm. what you're telling me right now. Like, I've never asked my classmate where they are from and they've never asked me, mm -hmm. unless someone is new. Like, you know, if we get a new student in right. the class, perhaps we ask if they come from another city. But, uh, but also yeah. it's, it's the French mindset. Like, it's both good and bad. In, in, we think of it as like, you know, universalism is one of the key French values that we're all quote unquote equals. And just a human is a human and a French person is a French person. And also because of colonization, yeah. there is this uh, spirit of the French, which is to like swallow up the rest of the, <laughs> of the world really. Like, I mean, the French have swallowed the world uh, unless the British were already there. Like that was the only thing that could stop us. Like if we arrive <laughs> somewhere and oops, already taken. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's not actually <laughs> funny, but yeah, it's literally yeah. how like colonization happened. Like uh, the, the Portuguese mm. were in one or two places, but you know, not, not, more, not much. And yeah, I have this mm. idea that like, if, even if you're from Sub-Saharan Africa, you're still French. Hmm. Yeah. I actually, that's, um, did you ever see this book called Au contraire. No, I don't think so. Think, oh, it's so good. Okay, anybody listening to this podcast, obviously, if you like Angel and what he's doing and the subject of this podcast, you must read this book called Au oh, contraire. Gosh. I believe it's called Figuring Out the French, like the subtitle, I mean. Right. So Au contraire, Figuring Out the French. And it was written by two people. One American who'd been living in France for 20 years and a French woman living in America for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the two of them collaborated on this book because they had already been running for at least 10 years, a consulting company helping French companies do business in America and American companies do business in France. And so they'd already been explaining the culture differences to each other's right. countries for for many years and so they put everything they learned into this book and it's so good it's the best 
cross-cultural uh, or cultural explanation book I've ever read. It goes really deep into these things that growing up French, you might not have even questioned. Like they talk about the importance of the rooster and of the hexagon yes. and, <laughs> and things that don't show up in like a lonely planet guide mm -hmm. to, you know, how to ask for coffee or telling you to, you know, shake hands or how to kiss it on the cheek. Yeah. Um, these are more like deeper identity things. It's such a good book. Um, the other one, okay, so yes, everybody listening to this podcast, write it down, go read the oh, book, Au oh, Contraire, Figuring Out the French. It's a masterpiece. And then if you like that format, um, put as like the number two book to read in this genre is called Watching the English mm -hmm. by, I think the author's last name is Fox. Uh, but watching oh, the I English uh, is the second best book on this subject where she, an English woman explains English culture to the world. But yeah, I just love these books that get into the mindset of a country and help explain it to outsiders. Um, yeah. Yeah, at this point- I How do we get like on this? It, oh. I feel like I should tell you that I have a rule on this podcast that whenever someone is quoted, I have to invite them next. <laughs> before that would be cool before, before you keep quoting like 100 people you know, okay i mean so benny lewis is already there and then the author of these two books we're gonna have to just find uh, who that is and my assistant would just you know send them an invitation being like hey derek Silver quoted you and now we, we are happy to invite you cool. to the future episode so yeah well i'll stop quoting now to say no, it's okay more. you you, but, you, um... you can quote i actually want to make more of these episodes and I have to find people so cool. yeah keep keep going so they did in that book, the Au Contraire book, they said um, the thing that you were just talking about. They said in, in France, there's this idea that even if you just arrived from Algeria a few months ago, you're French now. Yeah. You're, this is, it's this unified idea. You're French. Whereas, yeah, in yeah. America, e not so. Even our far right extremists are uh, who wants to exclude the foreigners they cannot do it in a way other than excluding the people who don't have citizenship yet. Meaning as mm. soon as you are naturalized, you are no longer a foreigner. So right. if you arrived right. a couple of months ago, they will still want to kick you. But if, as soon as you get a little card that says you're French, then you're one of us. Hmm. Which is, I don't now, think there's another country where far-right extremism is like that. Well... Hey, I don't know about that, but let me ask you this. Um, see, growing up in America, th that question of where are you from felt to me like a bit, of, a little bit like tribalism or, or clubs. Mm. Like, are you in the Italian club or the Irish club right. or the Polish club or the Russian club or we the judge English you club? For that. Uh, us French it's... judge the Americans for that a lot. Ah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is when I went to Switzerland, mm -hmm. And I was talking with a Swiss guy and he was asking me something about American culture. And when I said that, I kind of stopped and I thought, well, everything in America is from somewhere else. Right. Um, pizza is kind of American, but it's kind of Italian, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, I don't know where baseball comes from, but anyway, the point is like, you know, hamburgers are kind of American, but they're kind of German. Yeah, um, the name, and <laughs> you know. Yeah, and so he said, he said, oh yeah, that's like Switzerland. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, in Switzerland, there's almost nothing that is just Swiss. It's like everything is either French or German or a little bit of Italian. He said, the, yeah. in Switzerland, it's, it's, it's always one of those three you're always kind of, you're either French or you're German or you're Italian, even though you're Swiss. Mm -hmm. And then, so I read a, a book called Swiss Watching, I think, um, mm -hmm. that, that also explained that the first thing Swiss will ask each other is where are you from, but they mean which canton. Right. Like, because those are your deeper roots because most people don't switch cantons that much in their life. Mm -hmm. And so in Switzerland, it's like, that's the identity question. So in a way, I wonder about the similarities of Swiss culture and American culture with this kind of needing to, needing to kind of tribalize you and narrow it down. Like which, yes, you're Swiss, but which, which part of Swiss are you? Which club are you yeah. in? Which I, by I, the way, quick aside, did you know that when 
they founded America in the 1700s uh, with the 50 states, uh, they were directly imitating the Swiss cantons. Really? So I did not US know states are imitations of wow. the Swiss cantons. Impressive. Yeah. They liked that decentralization and yeah, that's where yeah. that came from. I, I never thought that the Swiss culture could be compared to the US culture in this way. Uh, the thing with the Swiss culture is that they have, like when you say they are French or they're German or they're Italian, really it's their language which they speak. And it also divides the culture in many ways. So they, they have a lot of uh, participative democracy where they have referendums and they ask questions to the population. And very often the answer they will give, like if you, you put it on the map, will be different depending on the language area. Mm. Which is weird, like they asked recently about um, keeping, uh, whether to keep the military service or not a few years ago. And it's kind of like, I think all the German speakers voted yes and all the French speakers voted no. Uh, possibly because in France, mm. we don't have military service, but at least in Austria, there is one. I'm not sure how it is in Germany. So I don't know if it, I don't know how much it relates to the countries that are around or just to their respective language. They also have this thing, which they call the Rusty Grenze. So it's the um, Rust, Rusty border. So Rusty is some sort of um, a potato, I don't know how to call that, like a potato uh, um, bun almost, or not a bun, but... Um, mm. Oh, a patty, like a potato patty, I guess. Some sort of like okay. flat thing made of uh -huh. potato. And okay. it's called the, the, the Rusty border because to the east of that border, there are the Rusties. And also in Germany and Austria, we have them. But to the west, so which is also where they speak French, they don't have it. And for mm. some reason, their culture is divided in this way. But the country is also really, really old as a country. I mean, it was there, I don't even remember, but I don't know when Swiss... Switzerland was founded, but it has been it has been there longer than the US, obviously, mm -hmm. because they could imitate it. So, and the people are from there. It's not like it's not like the French and the Germans have migrated to, to Switzerland. So it's definitely right, different. Right. So I've yeah. never thought of of looking at it this way. But you're right in the idea that they are very uh, tribalized. It's just mm -hmm. that they are the tribality or tribalism is related to the area. While in the US, you, yeah. you do have a bit of that, like, you know, more Dutch in New York, for example, but not mm -hmm. as much as in Switzerland, where, like, it's really clearly delimited and they right. don't even speak the same language. Yeah. yeah. You know, you might find interesting. So I lived in Belgium for a while. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, that's the same over I, there. Flemish yeah, and so French I, speakers. Yeah. I thought I was going to live there longer. So when I first arrived, I was like, okay, this is my home. I want to get to know it. Right. And... Uh, so I started in Brussels and I met up with a bunch of people in Brussels and everybody I said, okay, so tell me about, um, tell me about Belgian culture. And all of them would talk about all of this French Belgian culture. And they right. talk about the, you know, the, the Belgian food and the Belgian artists and the Belgian authors, but all of them were like the French Belgian mm -hmm. authors. And I said, well, what about like the Flemish Dutch half? And they're like, oh, we don't know what they do yeah, up there. They even don't <laughs> like each other. I think it's right. Worse, and so, to be wait, honest. <laughs> so then I went up to Antwerp and mm -hmm. uh, met up with a bunch of people that were from there and people in, yeah. in Bruges and Ghent. And I said, So tell me about Belgium. Like, this is going to be my new home. So, what can you tell me about it? And they talked about the Flemish painters and this. And, that. and I said, Well, what about the French half? And they went, oh, We don't know what they do down there. And it yeah. just, it was funny that they, it was this, this, uh, sorry, I'm drawing the uh, diagonal split of Belgium. <laughs> yeah, it will, it will yeah, be they... difficult for the people hearing the audio version, but that's fine. Like a lot of people can watch it on yeah. YouTube. That's good. <laughs> but, um, but the, I see Belgium as kind of like, um, if you've ever, if I was going to say, if you've ever made, but you can even imagine two pieces of wood that have a peg in the middle to hold them together. Mm -hmm. Where it's like you draw, you, you drill, you've got two pieces of wood that are separate and you drill a yeah. hole in one and you stick a peg on the other. And so then the peg goes into the hole like that. And that peg is the only thing holding the two halves of the wood together. I think that like Brussels is this peg. Or the king. That's, they always say the king is the, the only guy who's Belgian. <laughs> right, yeah. So uh, it's the, yeah. it just seems like those two halves of Belgium would just split apart if it weren't for Brussels so inconveniently. Uh, being this French city in a uh, in the, yeah. in the Flemish area, otherwise the two would just split apart if it weren't for that little peg. 
Probably, yeah, like that Brussels and the King are both the, the two things that keep some sort of German unity, not German, Belgian unity. Yeah, I don't yeah. know which, what, what would be the peg in Switzerland? Oh, I don't know. No, I think, it, no, that's... They don't have a peg. They just have the host. No, that's got, that's got a separate thing. Like you said, like that's more like they've been Swiss for centuries. Yeah. Um, and so they still identify as Swiss. No matter the canton, but yeah, I, I, the the voting thing you were talking about made me think of that. I wonder if Belgium votes along language lines as well. Huh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't actually know that, but I know that Belgium has the extremely complex uh, administration system. I hope someone in on YouTube will be Belgian and will like comment details of that because <laughs> I, it's something I know top of my head from being a French teacher and just knowing a bit about French speaking countries. Mm -hmm. Their administration system is so complex that you could be like for different areas of your life, be part of six different like administration that have that are completely mm. differently cut. Uh, and so, like you know, for like health insurance, you could be part of an area that has nothing to do with the area that you're for. For uh, oh wow, uh, I don't know, like what else, like voting, for example. Mm. And it's it's just it's really weird how it's organized. I don't, I don't really mm. get Belgium. <laughs> France is much oh. more of a centralized country in comparison. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so I didn't ask your question about, we got on a tangent. You asked, why yes. am I living in New Zealand? And I said, yes. that, yeah, my son was born in Singapore. And I love Singapore with all my head. It's a really smart place. Uh, it's so well run. I so admire the government. And I know it's like they're... Um, the very uh, Confucian top-down way they do things with kind of this paternalistic government would not work in most countries. And so right. people often criticize it going, ah, oh, I can't believe they do things like that. I think that's wrong. But what you have to understand is it's right for them. Mm -hmm. Like in that little multicultural city, yeah. that's what was necessary for the unity of that particular place. And yes. I'd be happy to go more into that if you'd like. I mean, but I, first, I, I have to just get this whole tangent out of the way. Right, when you ask it, why, I, why, why am I New Zealand? Not. It's like, <laughs> yes, that my son was born there. And so I thought he was going to grow up there. But then when he was about, once he was a few months old and I was starting to spend a lot of time with him, I realized that there's not much outdoors in Singapore. And I mm -hmm. felt it was like a human need yes. to connect with nature especially for kids. I just think like kids mm. need their hands in the mud yes. and their feet in a river and trees and branches and sticks and, and Singapore lacks those things. And mm -hmm. so I thought I really want my kid to grow up in nature. So ideally he would grow up in New Zealand. That would be amazing if I could get right. the visa. So I applied for the visa and it was nine months of work and I got it. And so moved here when he was uh, eight months old and he's grown up here entirely mm -hmm. except wow. for our year and a half in england wow so anyway that, that is so that's why we're because, here it's really because, because of, of him that you're uh, in mm -hmm. nature right right yep. good choice yeah I'd, I'd love to hear more about singapore i was so impressed because i was working with a client who was living in singapore right at mm -hmm. the in the middle of the pandemic like when we had the first lockdown and she was telling me how she actually had just moved to Singapore and they had literally Ooh. put her on house arrest wow. because of the pandemic. Like yeah. she, ha she had an electronic bracelet and every day the government was calling her to double check that she was really at home, not doing something else. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was blown, like my mind was blown by the fact that they can actually do that and the population does not revolt. Try doing mm -hmm. that to the French, just for fun, you know? <laughs> we're, we're on the Chile under yeah. lockdown right now, uh, again, starting today here in Vienna. I'm mm. a bit annoyed, but thank God I work on the internet. It's not affecting me so yeah. much. And uh, the Austrians who never protest, they had like the biggest protest yeah. I've ever seen in Vienna yesterday, <laughs> just because mm. they are fed up with, with the pandemic. And we're not on mm -hmm. house arrest. I mean, I, I went out, I actually visited a, 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 not really a friend, more like a co-worker. She's also my friend, mm -hmm. but I did not visit her because she was my friend at the door because we mm -hmm. had some work to do this morning. And you know, like no one stopped me in the street. And in Singapore, I don't think yeah. I would have been able to do that. Mm. And it's just, yeah, well, different culture, I guess. Yeah, I would love to talk about Singapore. I Tell love me. that place. I mean, I, I really thought I was going to live there for 20 years. Um, 
I became a permanent resident. And I probably would still be there now if, well, that thing with, you know, raising a baby there. But but even then, like, I, I wanted him to grow up as, like, a ch young child in nature. But then I think Singapore is uh, about the best place in the world to be a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, it's so stimulating and so exciting but so safe that you're kind of free to go uh, have an exciting teenage time without the fear of, you know, doing permanent harm to your right. uh, self you know so i mean taiwan and japan are kind of the same but okay mm -hmm. so the thing you have to know about singapore if anybody listening is interested in why singapore is the way it is i highly recommend you go to youtube and search singapore uh discovery channel or something mm -hmm. like that D the the discovery channel um cable tv channel in the u.s did like a about a 90 minute long documentary on the founding of Singapore, like the history of Singapore. Right. And it's really well done because what you start to understand is that just 200 years ago, there was nobody there. Like on what the land that is now Singapore, um, sorry, I say 200 years ago, more like yeah, 1850, yeah, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, there was basically nobody there. Um, yeah. There were, it was not settled. There were no cities. There were a couple people at a couple little villages, but the British were going around the world looking for a strategic place to have a trading port. And so uh, Sir Thomas Raffles found this island and kind of said, okay, this looks good. Uh, and the British had given him uh, authority to negotiate. So he just negotiated with the local chief and said, can we have it? And the chief said, yes. <laughs> So he, <laughs> um, did he buy it or did he just get it for free? Or something like, no, happen? no, it's like, no, there was no fight. It was just a trade for uh, something, I don't know. And so, but the, the point is, there were basically almost no native Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. um, it was just this little island. And so when the British made it this business port, people came in to do business. So they came down from Malaysia, they came up from Indonesia, they came, especially a lot of them came down from Southeast uh, China. And so um, Singapore was always this multicultural trading port that had Indians and Malays and Chinese and Indonesians and each one of them, oh, and British, of course. Mm -hmm. And so each one of them had very different cultural norms, like right. what they considered to be right and wrong. Yeah. So in a place like Switzerland, like you said, it's been around for centuries. Mm -hmm. There's been this slowly developed over generations, common sense view of what is right and wrong. Right. And same with most countries, but mm -hmm. Singapore has none of that because there was nobody there and it was just people from everywhere coming into trade, right? So for decades, it was known as this lawless place where anything goes. It's, it had this nickname of Sin Galore wow. because, yeah. you know, just nothing but crime and it's, it's mm -hmm. trading port. It's nobody's real home. Everybody's real home is somewhere else. They come in here right. to do business. But then of course people settled and stayed. So I think this explains why Singapore, the Singapore government or the Singapore culture is so rules-based is because there is no common, uh, common shared idea of common sense. Mm -hmm. So the government had to be kind of top down and say, you must follow these rules because we can't right. just leave everything to common sense because what the Indians think is common sense is different from what the Chinese think is yes. common sense, which is different from what the British expats think is common sense. So we can't abide by common sense. Um, everybody has to follow these rules and that's how we're going to get along on this little tiny island. Cause it's very small, you know, you, you drive around it in one hour. Mm -hmm. um, that's the whole country. Um, and so that's why Singapore the way is the way it is. And because it's about um, two thirds racially Chinese, which often has this Confucian culture, which is very much like respect your elders, do yeah. what your elders say. That's the other reason that the, um, the very top down thing works. And then, so that's like maybe the seed of it, but then also the, the government that's been in power since 1965, since independence has done a really, really, really good job. And they, pay really well mm -hmm. and hire the smartest people and they're just kind of they're doing almost everything right and they they've got these brilliant political scientists that are doing what's best for the country even if the 
the uh, the populists disagree, right. usually the people running the country are right. This is what's best for the country, even if some don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, so there is this feeling I got there of just you know it's it you're you're wise to you're wise to obey. <laughs> You're wise nice. to do what the government says, not because of the punishment you'll get otherwise, but it's kind of like trusting. Because they trust the government to actually do the thing that's best for everyone. Which well, I do. We yeah. don't... Not everybody does. And I can understand that, uh, of course, do. if I had, yeah, if I had grown up there, uh, I might have a different point of mm -hmm. view. But as an outsider right. looking in, it feels like it's so well run. It's so well designed that it's basically the wiser thing to just to let the smart people do what they know is best wow. for their country. Anyway, so that's no, that's, that's part of why it, it, my outsider opinion, that's why Singapore is the way it is. I have to go there and double check it. <laughs> um, it's this really because the story that you, you say about the foundation, it sounds so much like the foundation of Dubai. And I was there last mm. month. Uh, I was there for a number of reasons. And one of them was uh, astrology because there's this thing called astrocartography, which you can, I've, I've really gotten into astrology. I, I wasn't into that back then when we were working together. So maybe it's surprising mm -hmm. to you, but I really got into astrology uh, this year, really. Like I studied it ex extensively. It just, it made more and more sense the more I, I dug into it. So I dug more. And there's this thing called astrocartography where you can take your natal chart and project it onto the earth. And it shows you some lines where you are expected to feel differently based on which planet line it is. It's a bit complicated, but I happen to have two of the best lines that go exactly through Dubai. Oh, wow. Yes. And I, so how did I it feel? Like, it, felt, it felt great. The energy of the space is amazing. And that is huh. one of the main reasons why I went there. Uh, the energy is better than that of Vienna because in Vienna, Vienna is right in between a great line and a challenging line for me. And I can actually feel how it's empowering and limiting at the same time. While the energy of Dubai is just like absolutely like fundamentally great, but the huh. city is horrible. <laughs> I mean, I, I came back to Vienna after that trip. I was only there six days. I had planned for nine days, but I just kind of shortened it because I was like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> and, um, and, and I came back here and I was like, yes, I, I understand that the energy here is not as strongly positive as the energy in Dubai. Like I could stay on a beach in Dubai and, you know, beach, hotel room, and that's it. <laughs> that I mm. actually think I will do in the future. Uh, well, here, I'm like, I feel that it's not as great as an energy, but the infrastructure is so awesome that it just makes up for whatever the energy could be not perfect. While in Dubai, mm. the infrastructure is horrible, but um, maybe it will eventually become in the future like Singapore is now because... What happened to Singapore in, what was that, 18th century with the British? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, uh, late 1800s, 1880. Okay, so end of the, of the 19th century. It basically happened to Dubai 20 years ago. Mm. 20 years ago, there was nothing there. But, you know, a couple of people, okay. camels is the desert. And they created a city right. out of nowhere. But the thing is, I looked at it, I'm like, it's not really a city. There isn't even, like, there are no streets. Like, there, the streets have no name. And there hmm. is no street number. It's extremely destabilizing for a European person to arrive there. It's just a pile of buildings alongside the motorway. And you can only go there in Ubers. Uh, well, there's like two tube lines, but you no, know, one of them is out alongside the motorway as well. And the other one, I don't wow. even know where it is. And you have to take an Uber if you want to go somewhere. It's literally impossible to do it any other way. And wow. the only address you have is the name of a building. Wherever we have a street, you know, in Europe, basically, mm -hmm. the size of a, of a European street, that will be the size of one building for them. Yeah. And the building only has a name. And worse, the names all look alike because either they're in Arabic and they start with Al, or they're in English and they end with Tower. <laughs> <laughs> and thank, thank God for Google Maps, that's the only thing that saves us. But even with Google Maps, wow. you're in your Uber and at some point the, the driver arrives in like the area where you have to go and he points at some building is like is that where you have to go and i'm like i don't know you live here yeah <laughs> and then you have to enter that building and try to find the restaurant or the office or the wherever you have to go and i was like wow. this is a nightmare i would never like i'm still considering residency because i can see how it has a number of great um great points 
but I would never live there mm-hmm. even even part time. You know, like maybe two weeks a year. Hmm. Like if if you yeah. have residency, you have to be there twice a year to just keep it right running. Yeah. So you know, one week <laughs> one week in the spring, one week in the one week in the autumn. That would be like as much as I could probably tolerate with that city, oh. as long as it's so, so disorganized. How do you? So how did you say that you felt the great energy there while still having all these difficulties? Like, how do you separate those two? It's, um, I felt the energy when I arrived. And actually, that's the same in Vienna. When I used to live in Berlin and I would visit Vienna before I even land, I can feel the energy. I was like, ah, I'm in Vienna. That's like, that's the great energy, much better than Berlin. Because unfortunately, that challenging line I have that's close-ish to Vienna is straight for Berlin. It's like hmm. the worst, it's the worst place for me. If I had known it, you know, if I had been into astrology before moving to Berlin, I probably wouldn't have moved there. But I hmm. didn't know. And so even before landing in Dubai, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, next level. And I feel I can feel it on the beach, uh, like on the beach mm-hmm. and, and you know, next to the sea. It's just amazing energy. But I must not be trying to focus on some like going somewhere or, or solving some problem. Because then mm. it's it's like kind of overrides the whole energy thing. So if I go back mm. there, it's just gonna be holidays and or work, but work in a room, <laughs> not trying yeah. to meet people yeah. or yeah, hmm. yeah. It's great for holidays. I mean, where, like totally recommend. Wh- so where else on Earth do your lines converge? Where else is Okay, a, so a promising place for you to visit. The next one I, I want to go to again is uh, Budapest because I was only there one day. And the, the okay. great line I have that's next to Vienna is straight for Budapest. It's a Jupiter line. Okay. So that is, uh, that's the place where I want to go to. I don't have a better place in Europe. Um, hmm. I don't actually remember because Dubai was like the best across even the whole world. Okay. All the other places hmm. are because I have two lines there and it's the moon and yeah. the Venus. So best lines ever but yeah because it's it's so interesting um there are places that in theory i should like yeah like places that i read about places that i hear about places that i say that sounds like my kind of place and then i'd go and find mm, eh, i don't know something about it i don't like yes yeah, and then sometimes vice versa lines. yeah all right so sometimes just vice versa like i'd just be visiting a place and i'd go oh god there's something about this place that i love like that's actually how i felt about ghent belgium Mm -hmm. that when i would go visit ghent in particular like "Mm, i just love this place but to me it was like kind of the things you're saying about vienna it was just like yeah it's just the right size for me i like this size city i like Mm -hmm. uh i like the way it's run i like this i like the way it feels there's just something about it um and of course uh all of New Zealand like that. But then Singapore, for example, is a place that I didn't like at mm-hmm. all the first two or even three times I visited. I went, ugh, ugh, I hate it. I hate everything yeah. about this place. And it wasn't until a friend who's living in Singapore, I, like on my third visit, I was just passing through. And on the last day, he invited me to a party at his house. And at the party, he had like 15 people there. And as I got to know them, I went, oh, my God, I love these people. And so it's funny because uh, like five or six of my best Singaporean friends, I all met at that initial party. That's so interesting. And that's why I chose to move to Singapore was not because of the place, but because of the people. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I still don't love the place itself. I don't like the way it feels to be there. I don't like the urban claustrophobia um nobody really loves the weather there almost nobody right. um it's always you know sweaty um but the people i just love mm-hmm. the people there so much that that's why i loved it and i and i admire the way the government is run so that's why i always joke to say i love it with all my head you know <laughs> not like with all your heart it's a, all your head, right yeah. it's a smart place my heart's in new zealand my head's in singapore but yeah but my friends are in singapore and um but yeah, sometimes it's like, yeah, the place we love is not, um, it can be a surprise. Um, yeah, anyway, I could, yeah, it's... I could go on with the places, that I, <laughs> Chiang Mai, Thailand, Oxford, England, Ghent, Belgium, 
um, just these places that we don't even know why it is. And if somebody were to ask you what it is you love about this place, you might come up with reasons, but they are mm -hmm. probably just fake. You know, it's um, you just can't explain why you yeah. love a particular place. I mean, I do find that for me, there are really two things are like you need this energy thing and also the infrastructure. Because if the energy is amazing and the infrastructure is horrible, I'm not going to feel supported, you know, technically. Yeah, yeah. And I really need that. So that's it's like just like yeah. a trade-off. Well, have you heard about this, um, this approach to living called the five flags or the I was just thinking traveler. of that. Of course, I've heard of it. You were the first person to tell me about it. Uh, oh, I was. I recently, oh, okay. I recently read uh, the Nomad Capitalist book. I can put <laughs> okay, cool. him is already on the list. Uh, yeah, um, Andrew Henderson, he has a YouTube channel and, and everything. He's already on my blog. list for the podcast, but he's, uh, he's super busy, so it might take a while. Cool. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think of there are places that you would want to make your legal residency because they have exceptionally good, I should, uh, let's say, bureaucratic infrastructure. Yes. Right. So like Singapore would be a great place to be a legal resident of. Mm -hmm. And that's where you pay your taxes. And that's where you have your passport or driver's license or whatever. Um, maybe not passport. That's a different issue. But um, but but you wouldn't want to spend a lot of time there. Then there are places that that yeah, you might want to spend a lot of time, like say Brazil. Yeah. You might want to spend time in Brazil, but you wouldn't really want to have your legal infrastructure in Brazil. That'd be a mess. That'd be a um, nightmare, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of funny where you, you realize that one country doesn't need to be everything to you, that mm -hmm. you can have a country be part of your life, but not all yes. of your life. Yes, which makes me want to ask, where, where are you at with citizenship? Just New Zealand. Just New Zealand. So you're a citizen of New Zealand yeah. now? Okay. Is that yeah, something you have that's... changed a lot over time? No, no, just, um, no, just New Zealand. I, I moved here in 2012 and now it's 2021. So I've been so here for almost the entire nine sport. years. Yeah. Sweet, sweet. And so how many citizenship does your son hold? He must have a few. Um, four. Yeah. yeah. That's not bad. So which ones? U.S.? New Zealand, Singapore? Um, no, India? not Singapore, yeah. uh, India, and one other I'd rather not say. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> you don't have um, to share everything. Um, yeah, we were, it's funny because I, I was eligible for Portugal citizenship in two months, mm -hmm. but I can't wow. get it because of COVID. So it's, it's funny, I was actually, bad. I've, I worked for nine years to get an EU passport and both times at the, you know, when I was so close to eligible, of course that something stage. collapsed in the paperwork or now collapsed with my ability to travel there. And so uh, after nine years of trying, I give up no more, no more chasing passports. I'm done. I love right. New Zealand. This so is my only passport. I'm, I'm fine with that. There's something else I wanted uh, you to share about because I always think about you each time I write an email. And you said something on your website about writing for your audience, not for yourself. And you are the mm. person who told me how important it is to care about every single word and make things as, as short as possible and mm. as impossible to misunderstand as, like, as possible. And I would love for you to share that just you know, for the people to hear about it, even though it's a nightmare to do in practice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I learned this the hard way. Um, so listeners... Um, <laughs> for, for 10 years, I ran a music distribution company called CD Baby, and we had about a quarter million musicians distributing their music through me. And I had about 2 million customers that had bought music through me. Uh, and so sometimes I would email them, right. not a lot, but I'd email them with some new, say, service that CD Baby was offering. I'd say, attention musicians, there is now this thing that I can do for you. I can send your music to iTunes or whatever. And I found that if my emails were over six or seven sentences, people wouldn't read the whole thing. Right. And so then they would reply saying something like, great, how do I sign up? And I'd say, it 
look at the email you're replying to. It's right there right. in the eighth sentence. It tells you, here's how to sign up. Why are you replying asking how to sign up? Like, it's right there. Did you, are you not looking mm -hmm. at what you reply? But the truth is that no, a lot of people give about five seconds each to an email that's come in, right. especially on phones now. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not they're not necessarily sitting in a comfortable chair, putting aside time to look at their email. They're just their phone goes bzz, and they look at it and they go, eh, they give it five seconds. And so you have to tell them everything important. In like two to five sentences, and that's it. That's all you get. And if it's over that, they might not read it. So because I had a quarter million musicians and two million customers, if I was ever unclear, mm -hmm. I would get like 5,000 people hitting reply right. and asking me a question, and then it's which would then take me, mm -hmm. yeah, and it would take me, you know, like uh, 400 hours of labor to yeah. answer those 5,000 emails. So it's like, if I write one unclear sentence, or if I add one sentence too many, it's going to be 400 hours of hard labor for me. <laughs> So that was the ultimate punishment right. and training in how to be succinct. And so that's where I learned to chop out every unnecessary word mm -hmm. and remove every unnecessary sentence and just be direct and clear. Right. Um, and it, which is then very compassionate to understand your role in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. They're not saying, oh, good, a newsletter. I'm going to sit down for the I next know. 15 minutes and give this newsletter my full attention that is just in my inbox with the 19 other emails waiting for me. No, never. So, um, well, okay, almost never. Yeah, Somebody unless you somewhere. really, really like, the, I mean, I have newsletters that I read, but I, I, I know the right. content is going to make me a lot of money, basically. So, <laughs> I read it, yeah. you know. Right. But, yeah, it's an so, exception. Um, yeah, so I think it's understanding your role in their lives. And um, yeah, so that's that's why I'm so succinct in my writing. As you can tell, I'm not so succinct in my speaking because this is a different thing. It's me and yeah. you having a conversation. Right. But for things that I put out publicly into the world, um, that's where I learned the hard way, mm -hmm. uh, the importance of being succinct. Yeah, it makes sense that it's actually a lot more worth it to do if it's an email that you're sending out to did you say 250 million people I don't know, no no that 250,000 yeah, well still like you know yeah. versus one yeah. person um, because right. it, it's worth it I mean yes if you take an extra hour to write it but you save 400 hours of labor yeah yeah it's worth it yeah but actually not even just an hour I mean the this goes for a lot of things that the how it takes a lot of work to be succinct so mm -hmm. to write a five or six sentence email would often take me five or six hours. Right. That yeah. That, that to makes sense. over and over and over again edit and edit and edit and make sure that this is as clear as can be. But same thing with um if you search my name in YouTube or something, you'll see all the TED talks I've done. Mm -hmm. And most of them are only three minutes long. I did nice. three or four TED talks that were only three minutes long. And those would take months of course, to develop those three minutes yeah. because, again, you've only got three minutes to work with. And so you have to edit it down and then I'd have to memorize every single word of that three mm -hmm. minutes. It was kind of like, a, you know, somebody in theater having to memorize a three minute monologue on stage. Like I couldn't mess up a single word because that would throw off the timing. Um, and so, yeah, it can be much harder to write a six sentence email than right. a six page one. It can be harder to write a three minute talk than a 30 minute talk. Yeah, which is why I do a lot of 30 minute talks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, I mean, that's pretty YouTube, easy, you just get up and talk. Yeah, I used to do uh, one hour of live video on YouTube every week. I think I'm going to do it every month next year because once a week it's, it's too much, people just, but yeah, it's easy to just show up and talk for an hour. <laughs> It's not easy yeah. to show up and say the same thing in three minutes. So yeah. yeah, totally can relate to that. I'm just still an apprentice at this thing. And when I, I don't know if my apprenticeship has even started yet. I'm terrible <laughs> at this. I'd work on it, at, I promise. Have you found that this is consistent across different cultures that like everybody likes 
things to be succinct? Ooh, I don't know. Um, again, I think it's, it changes with the medium. Mm -hmm. Like I think for emails and for emails that are being sent in bulk, then I think it's always good to be succinct universally. But then there's a different, no, let's say there's a different thing. Like, let's say, I don't know a lot about China. I've only been once for a couple of weeks. Um, I've read a lot about it and I've wanted to get to know it more, but you know, life circumstances. Here I am in New Zealand with yeah. a baby. I can't go explore China for a year. A nine-year-old um, baby, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> just to you know what I mean. I, yeah. right, when I when I say here I am, I mean that was the time in my life when I wanted to go to China oh, the most okay. is when I was in 2012, 2013 with a baby. Right. Um, but um, I read about doing business in China where they said a lot of Westerners come into China saying, okay, hi, nice to meet you. Great. Let's talk about mm -hmm. our deal now. And the Chinese go, no, 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 no. That's yes. not what we do. Mm -hmm. It's it's let's spend a few days together. Let's just talk, right. you know, tell me about your family. Let's talk about our lives here. Let's have you over to my home. Let's, let's exchange gifts. So tell me, you know, tell me about your family. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's developing the relationship and getting to know each other well. Right. And only then after you're inside and kind of feeling like a friend, now they'll maybe do business with you. Right. Um, or if you're just going to come through with a handshake and, and, just try to do business right away well then you'll be treated like like a stranger in the yeah. marketplace like they Almost might as well just screw you over right? because yeah. this is clearly just transactional mm -hmm. you're not making any tie i don't owe you anything socially right um so i could say that's an example where it's very wrong to be succinct mm -hmm. but yes. that's a different thing than different than medium yes sharing an idea in writing for the world and, okay, so you mentioned people who send you newsletters where you stand to make a lot of money. I yep. remember reading that, um, what's his name? Jay Abraham. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Abraham is a master at direct sales, um, direct marketing sales. And, and he always said that um, long newsletters and long copy on websites sells better than short that that's once that's what i heard but i do not know if it's yeah. true even though i do have a lot of long copy on my website i still have yeah. trying yeah. to crack that code of what works better so yeah might, might be true as with all of this stuff it's like you know you can hear some dude on a podcast say something's true but you have to find out for yourself and do the tests yeah, it's, I mean, I, I do see the point for long, long, uh, long form sales pages and long copy uh, because, you know, that's like connecting emotionally with the audience and so on. But uh, you also have to be really, really good at writing it. I guess that might be the issue. In both cases, you just have to have really good copy, whether it's long or short. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't yeah much, good point. It doesn't really change yeah. the, the whole thing. That's it. your skills are not great with copy, and it's and it's getting worse and worse because the internet is more and more crowded. People don't have mm -hmm. time, and it's just yeah. I'm actually recently hired someone to write copy for me who is actually experienced with writing copy because I'm like okay, I give up. This is not this is not my strong suit. I want to be recording yeah. podcasts and, and working with my clients on having them you know learn French and uh, maybe a couple of YouTube videos. Even though I feel that I suck at that as well, I'm not really good at you know having them being seen by a lot of people it's something i need to improve but at least you know on youtube it's my face uh, the copy it doesn't <laughs> matter if i have written it or not <laughs> that's right. the difference yeah. so hmm. yeah yeah all right we are, we're almost out of time uh, there's a question that i always ask as the second to last question which is uh, are things in the world do you think that feel that feels in ah sorry do you feel that things in the world are getting better right now or is it getting worse or is it personally like always the I think same? Better. I think you. So is there you more can, understanding between people, or I don't know what other people do, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think you you kind of have to believe that the world's getting better if you want change. I mean, the there's an implication to thinking either way. 
if you believe the world's getting worse, mm -hmm. then you will want to stop all change. Right. Um, because every change means getting worse. And so those mm -hmm. are the people that say, quit all this changing, stop it, put things back the way they were. Right. Uh, and if you believe the world's getting better, then you welcome change because you believe mm -hmm. that the changes are continuing to make things better. So I think you have to kind of choose your stance on whether you want to stop all change or whether you want to welcome change. Or maybe right. you could do it backwards. If, you, if you're not sure whether you think the world's getting better or worse, ask yourself whether you want change or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do believe that all progress happens with change, uh, even if it's messy and makes some mistakes before finding its ultimate benefit. Um, so yeah, I generally believe things are getting so better. We need to um, believe that things are getting better because it's a better bias to have, right? Yeah, it's, you choose, you can see whatever you want to see. You can go to a party full of people and make a point of looking for the sad ones. Right. <laughs> or you can go to a party full of people and make a point of looking at the happy ones. It's kind of like we we all have a camera, right? Mm -hmm. That you can you can focus your camera on whatever you want. Some people yes. can go to a, a happy place and find something sad about it. And mm -hmm. and so yeah, if people are tuned in too much to the channels where people are yelling and angry and outraged and complaining all the time well, then you might get the impression that the world is a terrible place. But if you just turn off that channel and tune your inputs to a different source, you can find that the world is getting better and better. Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Do, do you sense. know about Future Crunch? Look up no. Future Crunch. Future it's, crunch. It, uh, take the word, the, t the two words Future Crunch together, but put the uh, dot before the CH. Mm -hmm. So Future Crunch. CH okay. is the website. It's an Australian based newsletter where they look for the good news in the world and share it. It's right. really wonderful. So this, this is a great last reference to give to the people. Um, so thank you very much. My very last question is always, where can people find you? Go to my website, SIVE.RS. Everything is there. All my books are there. My interviews are there. Everything is there. Perfect. That's amazing. So thank you so much, Derek, for joining me today. Thanks, Angel. This was an amazing episode. I loved having this conversation. If you listeners have enjoyed it as well, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform or a comment on YouTube because they will, this will help us find more listeners and more awesome guests like Derek to make more awesome episodes. So thank you so, so much for being a listener to this show and I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks. It was good to see you again. Bye -bye. Thank you, Derek. It was amazing.